Uh, let's get started. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Alan Hudson from the Immuno Oncology Translational Network Data Management Resource Center. I also serve as chair of Biostatistics, Biostatistics and Bioinformatics at Roswell Park Conference of Cancer Center. Before we start the seminar, I just have a few bookkeep bookkeeping items to go over. Questions will be responded to at the end of the presentation. Please enter your questions in the Q&A box. Please do not enter your questions in the chat box. The audience can prioritize the order of the questions by clicking on the thumbs up button. Closed captioning is available. The closed captioning for today's webinar can be accessed by clicking in the live transcript option in the Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen. Instructions are also provided in the chat box. If you're having technical issues, you can make a comment in the Zoom chat box. With that, I would like to turn the proceedings over to Mr. David Ahrens, who is Chief Executive Officer of the National Brain Tumor Society. Prior to, journey, prior to joining NBTS, Mr. Aaron served in leadership and external positions at the American Cancer Society in Minnesota, the Center for Lobbying in the Public Interest, and at Independent Sector. As an attorney, he previously represented patients facing disabilities and serious health conditions. He is the author of several books, including Power and Policy, A Funder's Guide to Advocacy and Civic Participation, Strengthening, Strengthening Nonprofit Advocacy, and A Voice for Nonprofits. David has served on the National Cancer Institute's Council of Research Advocates and Clinical Trials Advisory Committee. In 2016, David was named to the Blue Ribbon Panel of Experts, selected help advise the National Cancer Moonshot, led by former Vice President, now President Biden. David? Thank you. Great to be here today. And thank you for uh, the organizers of this event. Thank you to Drs. Armstrong and Gilbert for your leadership and looking forward to this webinar today. Uh, welcome, everybody. And thank you for taking time out of your schedule to join us today for this very important uh, National Cancer Moonshot related webinar on neuro oncology and the brain tumor community. Today, we're gonna to be hearing about one of the important ways that the National Institutes of Health has advanced the National Cancer Moonshot since 2016 to propel science and medicine forward to ultimately find cures for brain tumor patients. Recently, the President, President Biden reignited the cancer moonshot with the goal of reducing the death rate of cancer 50% over the next 25 years. This is a, an audacious but doable goal, but to reach this goal, we're gonna to have to make progress in all cancers, including those that are rare and recalcitrant like brain tumors. And with that, today you'll be able to hear part of that, this important national strategy to move forward and reduce those mortality rates and bring forward promising and hopefully transformative treatment options for brain tumor patients that improve survival and quality of life. You're gonna hear from two of the foremost experts in all of neuro-oncology and the leaders of the neuro-oncology branch, Drs. Mark Gilbert, Drs. Terry Armstrong. And you'll be hearing in their presentation about promising clinical trials. You'll hear about the importance of molecular biomarker testing to diagnosis and treatment. You'll hear about all that the neuro-oncology branch has to offer patients, their families, and researchers. You're gonna hear about the collaborative team science that Dr. Gilbert and Armstrong have brought to the brain tumor community, as well as the results of funding from the moonshot that the neuro-oncology branch is working on. You'll hear very important work that's ongoing about addressing rare, rare cancers, particularly rare brain tumors that are often left behind. You'll hear about the ways they're leveraging national networks and data sets and building new data sets to learn from every patient, to also address survival and quality of life that's so important to patients. And very important to the National Cancer Moonshot efforts to address health disparities and the barriers to research and care that are so important to close. And finally, you're gonna hear about how under the leadership of the neuro-oncology branch, they're bringing all of us together in the brain tumor community and beyond to bring our collective power to bear to help the brain tumor community and unite to serve brain tumor patients. So with that, it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, the branch 
leads here at the Neuro-Oncology Branch of the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Mark Gilbert and Dr. Terry Armstrong. Welcome, Mark and Terry. Thank you, David, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to the organizers for giving us the opportunity to talk about uh, our program uh, for rare CNS cancers. So as David mentioned, uh, I co-lead this effort with my uh, partner, Dr. Terry Armstrong, um, and we'll be talking about the NCI Connect Connect standing for Comprehensive Oncology Network Evaluating Rare CNS Tumors. And again, the, the emphasis is on partnering. We're partnering to improve care and treatments for patients uh, and people living with rare brain and spinal cord tumors. Next slide, please. So what is a challenge of rare cancers? I think David did a wonderful job alluding to these challenges. Uh, for the patients, um, uh, there's not a lot of information known about many of these cancers. And when they visit their physician uh, early on and the physician uh, you know, is not that familiar, it, it does bring some uncertainty. Of course, there is not as much in the way of social advocacy support nor clinical trials. Looking at it from the, the investigative uh, perspective, again, very difficult to have clinical trials when the patient population is small and often geographically dispersed, and it's often difficult to get funding, which is why I think it's so important that we did receive the support from the Cancer Moonshot. So all of this underscores a need to, to develop a patient engagement network with collaboration uh, with well-funded research. Next slide, please. So why study rare cancers? Of course, David alluded to the, the terrible unmet need, but from a scientific standpoint, there have been seminal discoveries that have evolved from these rare cancers. Look at retinoblastoma. This was the, one of the first examples of a loss of a tumor suppressor gene, the concept of oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. And in the context of the rare CNS cancers, the atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor with the altered transcription being the key driver, the midline glioma where we find mutations in histone genes, uh, and in ependymoma, the Rele fusion where we have chromothripsis, shattering of the chromosome and reannealing. Again, prime examples that have led to these seminal discoveries. And again, at the, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is address an unmet need. Next slide, please. So what about our, our program? Well, uh, when we heard about the patient engagement uh, recommendation, uh, we joined forces with our colleagues in the pediatric oncology branch with their interest in rare uh, pediatric cancers. And we formed the Rare Tumor Patient Engagement Network, RT-PEN, and have developed our two programs, the NCI Connect and our colleagues in pediatrics with their MyPART uh, network for rare uh, tumors in pediatrics. Next slide. So what, what's our mission? Of course, it's to advance our understanding of these rare CNS uh, cancers. Um, and we're gonna do it by fostering the patient advocacy provider partnership, creating those networks. So our goal is step, uh, to establish an infrastructure, which I think we've done very successfully to collect, analyze and share data, and then to ultimately translate these discoveries into new and better therapies. Next slide. So we have chosen out of the more than 130 primary brain and spinal cord tumors, 12 tumor types, which we think uh, reflect areas uh, of, of unmet need and certainly areas uh, that warrant a further investigation. They're listed here in alphabetical order. Next slide. And in the context of our discussion today, you'll hear about our clinical care and studies with our assessments, natural history study and therapeutic trials, our new treatments, click. Uh, our outreach uh, efforts with websites, social media, et cetera, um, and our research and collaborations with our scientific workshops, partnerships, and investigator network so we can better understand the disease. Next slide. Let's turn to clinical care. So very importantly, we have, ha have established a clinic, which we call the NCI Connect Clinic for these patients with rare uh, CNS cancers. It is led by our colleague, uh, Dr. Marta Penis Prado, pictured uh, on the slide. And the idea is to bring together these patients who have these rare cancers. Um, we formed this clinic uh, back in, uh, in uh, 2017 when we were first funded. And of course, we've had to transition part of it, but we are successfully combining both in person visit as well as uh, a telemedicine uh, to successfully. Uh, keep up this effort. And remarkably, as you can see, more than 40% of the patients who are referred to the neuro-oncology branch clinic uh, have one of these rare cancers. In addition, as you'll hear about the virtual tumor boards, 
Uh, we do have a genetic counselor, which is an, an incredibly great resource. Um, and we've established some patient support like a CARES group uh, and meetings with a health and wellness counselor. Next slide. I want to focus on the tumor board. We have expanded this uh, to be a national and at times international effort. Uh, our colleagues from around the country are welcome to join, uh, present cases. As you can see, we've had uh, in the last year, 28 providers, 41 cases, 24 meetings. We typically get uh, up to 70 people participating in the tumor board. Great opportunity uh, to share uh, difficult uh, cases uh, and to advance uh, knowledge. Uh, Next slide. And so uh, we were able to present the results of this innovative uh, multi-institutional tumor board at the recent Society for Neuro-Oncology meeting. Next slide. I mentioned about genetic counseling and we're very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Margarita Regatta as part of our team. Um, she does uh, evaluate uh, the cancer risk uh, using a family pedigree uh, and, and has made some very uh, uh, interesting observations uh, on uh, various changes such as joints, skin as pictured here, as well as eye changes, um, and does do a germline analysis for cancer risk and looking for hereditary syndromes. In addition, we have a great partnership with the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics at, at the NCI, as well as Baylor University. And here we're doing uh, epidemiologic studies uh, looking at potential uh, risk genes. And we do have uh, some work that's going to be presented actually next month at AACR. Next slide. Let me turn now to clinical studies. Next slide, please. So to start with, we have established an NCI Connect clinical trial network, 33 sites across the United States, as you can see pictured on the map. And we have a variety of both uh, uh, therapeutic as well as non-therapeutic uh, clinical trials open, which I'll talk about in greater detail as well, uh, uh, Terry and her part of the talk. Uh, these are all nationally recognized tumor, brain tumor centers of excellence, and they're all under an agreement. Next slide. So our, our first study is actually a non-treatment study. This we call the Tissue Outcomes in Pregnancy Substudy. It's led by Dr. Penis Prado. Um, and the idea is that we'll collect tumor tissue that is clinically annotated uh, with the idea of emulating uh, the work uh, that has been done successfully in the TCGA program. Next slide. Uh, we have very successfully uh, had an effort just like this when uh, we were part of the Collaborative Ependymoma Research Network, or CERN. This effort was led by Dr. Armstrong, as well as Dr. Ken Aldape, who's now the head of pathology at the NCI. And we were collecting ependymoma tissues. And as you can see, we had 726 patients. And this led to a classification scheme uh, demonstrating there were nine subtypes of ependymoma, a real seminal uh, effort uh, in ependymoma. Next slide. So the tissue study rationale is again to apply this across our uh, 12 different diseases. Again, because of all the issues that we've talked about earlier, we do need to get a critical mass of clinically annotated tissue to do the molecular analysis and compare it with the clinical outcomes data. So we have some basis uh, understanding of the basic biology as well as potential therapeutic targets. Next slide. So let's turn to treatment trials. So Dr. Pinus Prado is the PI of a study looking at a checkpoint inhibitor nivolumab in rare CNS cancers. This encompasses 11 of the 12 rare tumors in our program. Um, and uh, an interim analysis showed some really quite encouraging results. And she was awarded an abstract at the recent SNOW meeting for excellence in rare CNS disease research. Next slide. Uh, Dr. Jing Wu, um, a tenure track investigator in the NOB, is studying uh, IDH mutated glioma, including oligodendroglioma. Um, and she has a hypothesis that as these tumors uh, undergo malignant transformation, they become hypermutated, um, as well as other uh, changes in their metabolic profile. Next slide. Um, and so, emulating the biallelic mismatch repair and the hypermutation, click again, please. Um, where we do see responses in brain tumors. She's asking the question in this clinical trial whether the hypermutated IDH uh, mutated tumors actually have a better response to immune checkpoint inhibitor. Click again, please. She also has a second study where she's monitoring patients with IDH mutation using advanced 
MR spectroscopy and monitoring the level of 2-hydroxyglutarate, the oncometabolite that results from the, the IDH mutation. Next slide. We are also quite fortunate to be leading the uh, first in human study of an agent called onc 6 Dr. Brett Thieler uh, is the PI of this study. And as I will show you, uh, work done in our laboratory showed that onc 6 um, is an effective agent, particularly in those tumors that overexpress uh, NMIC um, and also have an elevation of the DRD2, the dopamine receptor, um, uh, that is the direct target of ONC206. Next slide. So Dr. Jinkyu Jung in the laboratory did this seminal work. On the left-hand side, I to show you that the, the predecessor to ONC206, ONC201, has actually shown responses in histone-mutated glioma, very difficult cancer to treat. And we are quite excited that uh, Dr. Jung's preclinical work shows a very strong correlation uh, between the DRD2 dimer, which correlates with response to ONC206, and NMIC expression, which is characterized in some of our uh, high-grade glioma. Next slide. Another. Uh, study that's in, uh, in the process of being developed and will soon be going for IRB approval is targeting a specific subtype of ependymoma called the MCN amplified ependymoma. Uh, this is actually the 10th subtype recently recognized and Dr. Armstrong will talk about it in greater detail during her part of the talk. It has a poor prognosis and it is characterized almost exclusively by this MCN amplification, which we think uh, leads to um, DNA supercoiling. So Dr. Uh, Penis Prado, working with one of our clinical oncology fellows, Dr. Joseph Woolley, have created a, a clinical trial where we're testing a very potent topoisomerase inhibitor, PLX038. So again, using the molecular information, looking for a specific and active target. Next slide, please. And uh, another uh, study that's in development is again, targeting a, a unique finding uh, in a subtype of ependymoma. This is a fusion of YAP as opposed to the RELA I talked about earlier. Other cancers, other ependymomas have a YAP fusion uh, and there is a wild uh, a, a neurofibromatosis gene wild type meningioma that also has YAP fusion. And as you can see by the illustrations, uh, we feel that this YAP fusion actually leads to activation of TAD uh, at the DNA level. And so we are going, going to be testing uh, a TAD inhibitor um, and Dr. Salmaz Sahibjan will be leading this effort with collaboration from our colleagues, uh, Eric Holland and Nader Sinai. Now I'll transition it over to Dr. Armstrong. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, I'm really excited to be here to continue the presentation of the uh, collaborative work that we've done, focusing on our outcome studies. One of the things we realized early on is that it's we don't really understand the, the trajectory of the disease <clears throat> for these rare CNS tumors. So I lead a natural history study within the neuro-oncology branch that allows us to follow folks from the time of diagnosis through their survivorship or end of life. And we collect not only clinical data, tumor samples, blood samples, but also patient reported outcomes. Within the natural history study, we have 339 patients who are one of the NCI Connect diagnoses. And we also have an online study, which is totally web-based, in which we also collect clinical history, patient-reported outcomes, and saliva sample for germline DNA, and have 301 patients enrolled on that study with these rare diagnoses. Importantly, as Mark mentioned, data collected within our natural history study was used to identify the high level of MIC and amplification in a subtype of spinal cord ependymoma that led to the recognition of this as a subtype in the new WHO classification of tumors. So we're incredibly proud of that collaborative work um, that was also replicated by uh, the group in Germany at the same time. In addition, we've been able to collaborate with collaborate with a number of pediatric networks. And at AACR this, this year, we'll be presenting a, um, the first histology-specific genome-wide association study for pediatric and adult ependymoma. So really appreciate that work as well as we look across the age spectrum for these rare uh, tumors. 
Because we recognize the impact of these diseases on the patient's life, we've been able to lead several studies within the outcomes group aimed at improving life quality for patients with these tumors and also to understand the impact of toxicities. Dr. Amanda King is the lead AI for a virtual reality study targeting uh, scanxiety for patients who are coming in for diagnostic imaging. Uh, this study is done completely remotely. Dr. Shibani Mulligan is leading a study in which we're utilizing Fitbit devices to evaluate sleep and activity in our patients to understand particularly the impact we see after cranial radiation with hypersomnia that can occur, work that she also leads in my laboratory. And then Alvina Quay is leading a study looking at COM developed by Gary Roden in Montreal um, that's used to improve depressive symptoms and improve quality of life in patients with other aggressive cancers, but hasn't been evaluated in those with CNS tumors or by telehealth. So we're doing that study now. We're really focused because this is a patient provider advocacy network on outreach and education. And to that end, we have a number of efforts. The first that you've heard of before by Dr. Gilbert is our CARES group. Prior to COVID, this was done in person, led by Alvina Quay, a health and wellness counselor, in which we addressed issues in living with these diagnoses. We've been able to transition that successfully to a web-based program that includes educational content as well as support. We also have outreach through a number of mechanisms, including a website, a newsletter, videos, Twitter, and a Facebook group that I'll share some details about now. The first is that we were able to develop a web website, NCI Connect, in which we warehouse information on tumor types and living with these diagnoses and treatment. This includes information that can be syndicated and used by individual centers and advocacy groups. Um, some of this information is the only information available in some of these rare tumors. We're incredibly excited that we've had 98% growth during the pandemic in terms of um, visits to our website. And in fact, we had almost a million um, views of our website last year. We launched a symptom management portion of this website in which we provide information on assessing, managing, reporting, and dealing with symptoms for patients with these rare tumors. And this website has had a 57% growth just in the last year. This content is um, organized in terms of self-care. So folks can find particular things that they're interested in looking at and they're able to print or share this information with their loved ones as well. We recognize that there is a dearth of information in Spanish language related to brain tumors. So one of our first efforts was to translate the information on each of the 12 rare tumor types into Spanish language. This effort took several months, but we have a Spanish version of our website up and running. Importantly, we have 15,000 average monthly visitors to our Spanish website after starting with 150 visitors the first month. We think we've really identified an unmet need for Spanish language content for the CNS tumor community and are continuing to work to develop more content. Our website is um, viewed by people around the world this is a pie chart that identifies the countries where people are accessing the website um, from. Of course, the majority are from the United States, but you can see that there are a number of other countries that are aware of and accessing this information, uh, which we're incredibly proud of. We have a number of other ways that we try to reach people with this information and content. We have a blog that folks can uh, subscribe to, and also a monthly newsletter and a bi-monthly newsletter for our partners, our advocacy partners. We have um, over 8,000 folks who subscribe to these, um, these, these newsletters and blogs. We've been able to set up a Facebook page for the NCI community. This is a closed space where patients and family members can log on and learn from each other because we realize that the lived experience that people have that are dealing with these tumors are important. And sometimes that's the best um, advice that people can get is from other people who are dealing with it. And we also have a Twitter feed. I hope you all follow us on there. We tweet through our NIH brain tumor, our branch our website. This is where our NCI Connect information is also shared. Um, in um, 2021, we had over 1 million impressions on Twitter. So we're excited that we're able to reach people in this way as well. 
We've developed 35 videos about brain and spine tumors. These are all very short um, lay language videos that are available for anyone to use that we hope can help describe some of the work that we're doing and also understanding of the particular diseases. And last year we developed an app. This is available for free on the iOS and we'll be launching an Android in we hope May of this year. This provides um, um, a tool for patients to be able to monitor their own symptoms, track what they're doing about them, seek information on how to manage their symptoms and share it with their healthcare provider, their family or their medical record system. So to close out this talk, we wanted to share the importance of research and collaborations that we've identified within the NCI Connect program. Most importantly, this is a partnership with our advocacy colleagues. And we have a number of partner organizations all listed here that really work together uh, with us closely to improve the outcomes of patients with rare adult tumors. We're incredibly grateful to this group. Our advocacy collaboration has led to meetings, both professional and for those living with the disease. And here's a listing of some of the um, events that we've held. We were proud to hold the International Brain Tumor Association um, biannual meeting. And at that meeting, there were 97 participants from 26 countries represented. We've also hosted individual tumor type web webinars like medulloblastoma, and then focus ones during COVID on patient-centered communication and telehealth and our partnership with the uh, National Brain Tumor Society and also an ABTA National Patient and Caregiver Conference as well. We try to pull together community and neuro-oncology as well as outside to focus on next steps in research, education, and care of patients with these rare tumors. These scientific workshops are a hallmark of our program and you can see a list of the programs that we've led. Importantly, these meetings not only include scientists, but they include our advocacy partners in lectureship roles and planning roles and in group leading roles. So we bring that group together with us to decide on content for these meetings. Importantly, we share these publicly and we publish preceding papers on our recommendations. This is an example of one of the publications that we uh, did after our focus meeting on medulloblastoma in adult. Importantly, not only this publication, which outlined guidance for care and research, we were able to reach out to the NCCN and updated and recommended and updated a, a change in the imaging recommendations for adults with medulloblastoma as a result of this meeting. In addition, last year, we hosted an international collaborative on research in patients with rare CNS tumors. This led to the publication of a supplement in the flagship journal for the Society for Neuro-Oncology, Neuro-Oncology, and you can see the breadth of information that was shared as part of this workshop. In all, we've had um, 83 abstracts, 10 manuscripts, and two NCCN guidelines that have been modified because of the incredible work of people working with the NCI Connect group. So in summary, both Mark and I hope we've shown you that rare cancers, including those of the central nervous system, are a serious unmet need. And through the Cancer Moonshot program, we've been able to establish a CCR-based research program and an extensive national network. We believe that this may provide a roadmap or a paradigm for investigation and in other rare tumors and our patient outreach activities have made rare brain and spine tumor community more aware of our programs and services and educated those related to these types of tumors. We'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge all the people that work on this program with us, in particular, the program manager, Brittany Cordero. Thank you, Brittany, for your leadership um, in this work and your partnership, as well as our program team, clinical team, and NCI for their support, both financially and scientifically for this work ahead. With that, I'll close and we can open it up to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. Uh, this is outstanding and uh, really looking forward to, to questions. Um, perhaps we'll um, start with one question here um, around, um, uh, since Dr. Armstrong mentioned natural history studies is, 
how, um, uh, if you could talk a little bit more about the model you're using for natural history studies and um, can that be expanded? Uh, how are you thinking about expansion of that to even more rare cancers? Thanks for that question. It's a really good thought. And we um, built this program actually on um, the glioma outcomes project that was done before this and work that we did in Appendomoma with the CERN Foundation. And because of how a referral pattern works, people come to us at many different places in the disease uh, trajectory. So patients, when they come in, we collect um, what their past history was before they were here and then going forward. We include within that epidemiologic risk questionnaires. So we ask about family history and own personal history at that baseline assessment. And we developed a novel tool that the clinicians actually seeing the patients enter the clinical data directly. So you don't have to go back and do natural language processing, or you don't need to have a data analyst to go look at that data through the medical records. It's collected in real time by the clinician seeing the patients, which has been an incre incredible uh, tool. Um, what we've designed is that we, um, we collect data at least yearly. So the ask that we ask of patients is we want to have this information at least yearly, and you don't even have to come back to us at that year visit. You can pr participate remotely. So we're at least collecting data at a year's time point on every patient. But patients who are coming in, we collect that information uh, more generally. And I think most importantly with our natural history study, we engage um, the data that we collect and share it with the clinical providers. So what I mean by that is if a patient completes a questionnaire on their symptoms or their depression or their anxiety, the caregiver, the physician and the nurse practitioner seeing that patient are given that information before the visit. And they're able to see that information over the last three visits the patient was seen. So it's an information tool, it's a communication tool. It's not just people entering data into a database that no one looks at until they wanna do an analysis. It's real-time use, which I think is really cool <laughs> as a clinical provider to have that information to use. So, you know, we are doing it within CNS tumors. We've talked across uh, folks within CCR and beyond about what we're doing, and we're happy to share the tools that we've created for those who are interested. So thanks, David. That, that's really great to hear. And it sounds like almost patients can help um, bring their rare cancer to the NCI. It's not just the NCI choosing which cancers to focus on. So that's, that's incredible. Another question we have um, for either one of you is really around um, the importance of accessing databases, knowing that how important patient, patient databases are, are to research. What, how have you overcome obstacles to sharing data, uh, whether it's clinical information, imaging, pathology, between multiple institutions? As you know, we're in an era where team science is so so important. And so how have you uh, overcome some of these barriers? Do you want to go ahead, Mark? Well, start? sure, absolutely. So this is uh, obviously very critical. Um, and we are in the process of developing a system whereby we can take um, the, the molecular data from the, the tumors um, that we are analyzing, particularly in, in uh, the, the tissue outcome study, uh, as well as pertinent clinical data and, and uh, uploading that into a, a national database. Um, so really important, have to make sure that uh, obviously uh, there's appropriate access and we have to be concerned uh, about uh, private health information um, and, and all of the other uh, issues, um, but it certainly is doable and the other part of that, which I think is important, is to make sure um, that we are able to at least provide a, a summary of, of the data um, and the information we glean uh, back to the patients. So not necessarily about their individual information, but as we learn more about their, their types of cancer, uh, that they have some access to the information that we're getting. Um, and so a patient-facing website with that type of information is also under development. I think it's one of the aspects of, of the Moonshot program. Uh, so we've been working with some of the folks on that team um, to create that, that patient-facing website. That's Terry, great. want to add to that? 
Yeah, maybe just to add, I think we also try to partner. So, you know, I, as soon as we started, we reached out to other people who were doing similar work to say, hey, what are you collecting? What are you doing? How can we share? We don't want to overlap. You know, is there a way that we can be sure? I mean, we don't want to burden individual patients by being asked to participate in five different groups and maybe getting that information. So we tried to do that. We've also partnered with groups. As I shared, the presentation at AACR is uh, through a network group uh, through Baylor, who's leading that work. Um, we've added people onto our studies as co-investigators that can ask questions on that data. And a lot of it's done through our network. So 32 centers have the opportunity to sign up and participate and have this data as well. And any site that participates have their, has their own data set as well, right? So they're collecting data on, on their folks that they can do, and they're also participating. So I think that partnership has been really important as well. Thank you, that's so helpful. Um, I had a couple questions around engaging with you. Uh, one, uh, one type of question is, how could extramural researchers um, approach you for uh, to do work together or potentially do a partnership? What's the best way to approach you? And a related question is, are you also doing work collaboratively with other NCI and NIH related uh, operations like NCATS, which is the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences and other NCI um, offices. Do you want to take the first part? I'll take the second. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to trade off here. So that sounds good. Yeah, I'm, I started to laugh because I was thinking when uh, Mark and I present, he usually says my email is, is uh, mark.gilbert at nih.gov, right? <laughs> so so really, we're really open to people reaching out to us individually. We also have a we have an email address for the NCI Connect program that people can email. But any of those ways, we're really open to those discussions. Um, we get approached very often about this, and we're, we're very open to it. You know, there's a number of ways individual investigators can reach out to us. UO1 programs are available if they have a project that they're leading that we can be a part of. We can even uh, participate, although would not take any money from outside grants if there is an idea that you have that we can provide expertise or information on. Um, we've also invited extramural investigators on our study. So within our natural history study, we have several people who are within partner organizations within NCI. So we have DCEG members, um, DCPBS groups. Um, we work with CTAP very commonly as well but also extramural investigators are invited as co-investigators on, on our study if they have particular questions that we think are relevant. So all of those are options and things that we are doing. Mark, I'm not sure if there's anything you had to add to that. Yeah, so uh, um, absolutely. We are, we encourage collaboration, right? We, we know that this is a great challenge. We are very fortunate to have fantastic colleagues within our network, uh, but we, um, are more than happy to, to help others, to work with others, um, uh, to, to leverage the resources that we've been so fortunate to, to receive from the, the Cancer Moonshot to, to advance the science, to advance the treatment. So absolutely uh, encouraged. Um, you know, some of our clinical studies um, are multi-center across our network. So that's, that's been a, a, a great advantage. Um, so yeah, absolutely, and and that email that that Terry mentioned is actually my real email. So, Mark Gilbert at at, at uh, NIH .gov. Mark is with a K. Um, if you put a C, it won't get to me. You know, but with a K. Um, so uh, we really do encourage folks to contact us. As far as within the NIH, I mean, it it's just a phenomenal uh, place. It, you mentioned NCATS. Um, I didn't uh, have time to actually go into great detail about the, the um, uh, program that Dr. Pinas Prado is leading with the MICN ependymoma, um, but uh, we are working with NCATS, uh, looking uh, at particularly selective inhibitors of topoisomerase. We have a candidate drug, uh, but we are really diving in with our colleagues um, on that study to, to really get at at the root of topoisomerase inhibition, particularly in the context of a disease that is driven by uh, the molecular alteration in, in, in NMIC. So it's very unique. It's, in that disease in particular, uh, there are no other genetic findings. So uh, we think that may be a real selective vulnerability and, 
and the, the resources at NCATS with their high throughput screening and their expertise. Uh, they, they've been fantastic partners. Um, across the uh, NIH, of course, we work very closely with the laboratory of pathology, with the molecular analyses, um, our, our neurosurgical colleagues, uh, imaging with, with neuroradiology. Um, but then we, we have access to folks who are experts in a variety of disciplines, uh, including immunology, um, and, and including things like e even DNA repair um, and chromatin biology. I mean, it's just uh, the resources there and uh, everybody has been so willing to collaborate. So uh, I, I think we're trying to, you know, really do the best work, the best science possible. Uh, and, and given the resources that exist at the NIH, you know, that's a, that's a real possibility. Outstanding. Uh, just staying with the science a little bit, a question on science, as you mentioned earlier, the IDH mutant glioma hypermutation study. And the, um, I think this probably comes from research around what's known about the association of germline variation with this phenotype. Um, so, you know, that, that is a great question. Um, there is a germline uh, IDH mutation. Um, it, it, it's called the, the IDH mutated germline is the Marfucci syndrome, uh, where uh, patients get um, bone abnormalities and also can get IDH mutated low grade glioma. It's very rare. It, um, so for, I, I think the vast, vast majority of the patients, we're not looking at, at germline variation, um, but there is certainly question whether um, there is a, a germline or a polymorph polymorphism related susceptibility since certainly um, only a, a relatively small percentage of patients with IDH mutated tumors actually become hypermutated. We do not know why some tumors do and others do not, whether it's an inherent tumor difference or whether there's some susceptibility gene that's inherited by the tumor. It's a great question and something as we learn more about uh, the evolution of hypermutation. Um, I think we can start to explore that in Dr. Wu's study where she's monitoring these patients with imaging and hopefully finding them some point in the transition from the lower grade to the more aggressive hypermutated phenotype. You know, being able to actually evaluate cancers in that space may give us some insight. So it's a, it's a great question and one we hope to be able to address in the next several years. Thank you. And uh, for whoever asked that question, it sounds like an open invitation to continue to engage the, uh, the neuro-oncology branch on issues of, of that kind. Um, one, uh, moving over to a different area around, um, it's great to hear Dr. Armstrong, how, how you're putting information in other languages, including Spanish. And so could you say a bit more about um, your, your plans to continue to expand Spanish language materials and to develop those and, and uh, get them out there. That's, uh, of course, so important to tackling um, language and cultural disparities. Oh, thanks for that question. Um, you know, when we set up the website, uh, Kristen Odom, who was our communication lead at that time, and I um, set forth to have what we call pages on each of the tumor types. And they're really um, um, soup to nuts about each of these tumors written in lay language, um, really answering and put forth as questions that patients may have or even outside medical providers may have about these tumors. So, you know, that part of our website, um, people were utilizing a lot. So that was our first approach was to go to those and translate them to Spanish language um, because we think it's a tool that can be used um, anywhere. The nice thing about those pages, and I mentioned it briefly, is that anyone can download, you can print them, you can save and share, but you can even syndicate it. So if there's an institution outside that has interest in having this information, it's freely accessible and shareable. We'd love everyone to use them um, in Spanish language. So when we first launched it, you know, we really wanted to get a sense, uh, you know, how is, how is this uptake? And the number of people who are utilizing these really, you know, was surprising to us, but exciting that this is a need and we need to do more. So um, we're really looking at our living with section of our website is next, um, which really takes people from 
you know, being diagnosed and kind of the emotional issues that can happen with that to dealing with recurrence to, you know, what are the symptoms you have and translating those next as, as our next piece going forward. So, um, you know, we're really excited to be able to provide this uh, resource for the community and, you know, really hope that everyone finds it useful and hopefully to expand from there. Additionally, we've uh, created flyers about all of, our, all of our studies right now, very simple flyers in a standard format um, that we also are translating into Spanish language as well. So, you know, having information on trials also in Spanish language, in addition to consents, which are always translated into Spanish language is kind of our next steps. Thank you, that's outstanding. And I know as being with an NCI Connect partner organization, we find all of these materials very helpful in trying to in turn help patients and families. We had a, a, a different question that relates to the subject of registries. And it's uh, of course, terrific that you're building, building databases, building registries, that then pour into natural history studies. But as you know, over the last 10 years, as technology and the world of big data continues to change, we see lots of different groups trying to build registries, whether it's hospitals, patient advocacy organizations, small labs, and trying to all do generally the same thing, and that's harness the power of patient information and experience and data to form uh, hypotheses and to advance science and medicine. Uh, so the question that was brought up is, what's the advantage of, of basing a registry at the NIH, say versus, um, in this case, an organization building one themselves or keeping the platform with, with say, a patient or patient groups um, uh, themselves. Uh, and I'm sure you've been thinking about these questions of what's the advantage of, of, of you all hosting and creating that infrastructure that then could be used. Yeah, I can start and then maybe Mark can add too. I think this is like the elephant in the room, right? Um, Cause you know, everyone, wants data, everyone wants to participate, everyone wants to use data. And at the time we started this, there really wasn't anyone looking at these particular tumor types. There wasn't anyone who was gathering this information. There are pieces that are taken on. So, you know, one of the things we did was we reached out to some of the existing groups that are doing registries, learned what they're collecting, tried to align so we're collecting similar information and made them aware of us and us of them. So if someone contacts us with a particular tumor type that we aren't collecting, we can refer to another registry and vice versa um, as a way to, way to share. We're also talking about ways to join that together. Um, I think one of the primary advantages is, is that we had the support and the mechanism to build this, this infrastructure and this data set to be able to do it. Um, you know, we were very thoughtful in the way that we pulled it together, um, but we were able to kind of have the, as um, Mark mentioned, to have the infrastructure to be able to set this up for these tumors. But our entire goal is to have this data accessible and shareable that other researchers can ask questions of it. So that's our mandate within the NCI Connect program. And we, we take that very seriously, putting this data together so it's shareable and usable by others. And importantly for that, we think sharing it directly to patients is important too. And that's one of our goals this year is to have the data we're collecting shareable on our website so patients can also learn from that data. So not only with researchers, but also with patients. So I don't know, Mark, if there's anything else you have to add to that. No, that was that was a terrific summary of, of our approach. Um, and, and I think, you know, the, the strategy has been successful. Um, and, you know, we were in, incredibly surprised, of course, happily surprised when, you know, the data for the 2021 website utilization was, you know, 941,000 visits. So that tells us in the rare, uh, tumor space, we have that outreach, we have that accessibility. So if you're looking at registry types of efforts, having that degree of visibility um, is, is a great asset. Um, it's, uh, we don't want to be exclusive, as Terry mentioned. Uh, we want to incorporate who, whoever wants to dedicate effort in, in this area. Um, it, it's going to take a large, you know, widespread effort to make advances. And certainly by having the infrastructure that's been created, um, then others can, can join in and participate and, and contribute. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's a 
great start and we're hoping to build on that and we're hoping that you know events like this gets the word out that we are looking for folks to work with. And you mentioned a, a moment ago return of information and how you of course take uh, information that is derived from the studies, the clinical studies, the natural history studies, the patient information from all these sources you're collecting and you publish. Uh, but it sounds like you also have a return of information approach back to back to patients, back to uh, the community outside of traditional journal publications. And could you take a maybe a sentence more about about your your plans with regard to that continuing democratization of information? Yeah, maybe I can start, you know, the, a lot of the data that we collect, whether it's Dr. Regatta doing the pedigrees um, with families um, or when tumor tissue is submitted and it undergoes integrated analysis with the um, laboratory of pathology under leadership of Dr. Aldabi, that information that is collected is shared directly with the patient with the, by the healthcare team. So they're given that information and are able to ask questions of it. So there's a direct to patient sharing of the uh, genomic evaluation, um, you know, family history information, if there's any risks identified, as well as um, understanding of the tumor tissue. Some of the data we're collecting, we're going to be analyzing in aggregate. So like the polymorphism work that we're doing, we collect that over time and we analyze it in an aggregate form. And those are data, rich data sets that we'll be able to share in other ways. So we're right now exploring um, exactly where that data will be housed, but the idea is it'll be shared in a nationally available data set so that other people want to go in and ask those questions. The clinical data is harder, right? So some of the data sets or data sharing plans that are out there don't collect as much of the rich clinical information we have or the patient reported data that we have. So that's why we're creating a system that we think can be shareable in that way as well um, so that other people can access it. Mark, Thank anything you. to add? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, just that, you know, I, I think we have uh, learned that patients would appreciate hearing how people with their type of cancer do um, and, and having that, as, as Terry mentioned, that aggregate data um, and the summarization of, of clinical data and outcome, um, I think will be very helpful. Um, again, as I, as I began uh, our discussion, you know, there's not a lot known or published about some of these diseases. And so, you know, the, even their healthcare providers um, would benefit from, from the information that we would, we would be able to share on sort of that public facing uh, format. One of the things that comes through loud and clear is, is how your program cares about patients, but it cares about everyone related to the patient, including caregivers. And could you um, I had one question from a participant asking about um, the unique needs of caregivers and how you involve caregivers in, in forming your research strategies and what, specific, what specifically would you like more of from caregivers to be engaged in the NCI Connect program? That's a really great question. You know, I think we recognize that these diseases are things that not only impact the person themselves, but the, the caregivers as well. So within our clinical care program, um, all of our resources that we have available are for patients and caregivers. So even our, our CARES group, it can, caregivers can come to that group and share their information and a lot of times their advice within that. Uh, we also encourage and support caregivers to come to the clinical visits when we have them at the clinical center. COVID, we had to restrict that somewhat, but that's opening back up again. Um, so they're invited and they're part of that discussion as we go, go forward. Um, when we've held our workshops, those are also available and we ask specifically to caregivers their thoughts. So for example, when we had our survivorship workshop, we had surveys sent out to patients and caregivers and asked what their thoughts, what does survivorship mean to you? What are, what are the primary needs that you have? So their voice was included in that workshop and in the planning as well. And within the outcomes group, we recognize that there's more that we can do. So we're um, very focused. Actually, I'm very excited that we have an eye care postdoc who's focusing on caregiver issues. And we're focusing specifically on how can we understand needs? How can we meet needs? Um, and that's her focus of research as well. So uh, more to come on that. Thank you. 
Um, uh, we've talked, uh, you mentioned earlier how important diversity is and diversity in terms of not just closing gaps and addressing health disparities, but how diversity is an asset and particularly in CNS tumors where we have diversity of all types, uh, geographic brain tumor types, um, spectacular uh, heterogeneity within, within a tumor, uh, diversity is all around us. And so do you mind talking a little bit about two things related to diversity? One is the challenges and opportunities to make scientific progress given uh, diversity of brain tumor type amongst rare tumors? And second, why it's important to engage uh, America's diversity, the diversity of the brain tumor community, and why that's important to advancing brain tumor research at a, at a person level. Do you want me to? Um, so uh, I'll start and I'll certainly let, uh, obviously, Terry uh, fill in because she's done some tremendous work in, in diversity. But again, the, the premise for the NCI Connect uh, or the uh, Rare Tumor Patient Engagement Network, so that uh, collective of us um, uh, with our, our colleagues in the pediatric oncology branch is, is recognizing that there's an unmet need uh, to engage patients who have rare cancer. Um, so in and of itself, that's, you know, the diversity there is that these folks don't neatly fit into you know, the, the big cancers, the breast, lung, prostate, uh, colon, et cetera. Um, and, and in trying to capture or, or to find those patients so that they can be part of the effort and hopefully benefit from our expertise and our interest, um, we do need to cross geographic boundaries, right? They, they don't actually all occur on the, on the two coasts. So we've tried with our network um, and we've certainly, I think, done a great job with our outreach uh, in approaching those uh, patients. And in the context of, of the interpatient diversity, I mean, this is an area of, of active investigation um, that is actually looking at both sex differences um, as well as racial differences in in the disease, in the biology responses, et cetera. And, and that's all part of the investigations that we're doing going forward. So Terry, did you wanna to add to that? I think you did a great job. You know, I think we're trying to reach people where they are. Um, and that's really important because a large part of the brain tumor community is cared for in community settings. So enriching information that can be available to anyone reaching people in any mechanism possible and, um, and collecting that information. So we understand, you know, what are the disabilities that people have, you know, what are the characteristics that they have and how can we do a better job reaching people wherever they are is a, a big part of what we do. So thanks for that. Thank you. I, I have just one final question and then uh, we'll move to wrapping up is, uh, as you know, uh, incidence and survival rates and CNS tumors have been, largely stagnant over the last 40 years. And the whole idea of this moonshot was to change that trajectory for all cancers and to start asking better research questions and form better teams and launch better projects. So as you look back on the last five years since the moonshot started and you secured funding for the Connect program, are we asking better questions? Are we creating better studies? Are we building better infrastructure to hopefully change the trajectory for brain tumors? So I would say unequivocally, yes. Um, I think that our understanding of the science, our uh, application of emerging technologies, so things like RNA sequencing and other genomic testing of these rare cancers has led us to therapeutic advances. Um, this type of translation I think is critically important to have those successes within the confines of diseases that are defined as CNS tumors has spill over into all of neuro-oncology. I also think that there's a greater appreciation within the sort of more common tumors like glioblastoma that there is heterogeneity and the approach that we've taken sort of from a biologic standpoint may have uh, important messages and, and, and um, you know, 
ways of approaching that disease. Um, I think the other important aspect is the proof that even if a disease is rare, um, and you could think of GBM subtypes as being potentially rare, there are ways of galvanizing the patient community, working with the advocacy partners, uh, as we have done so successfully, like the NBTS and the others, um, and proving that that is not a barrier to getting patient accrual and getting answers to hypothesis-based clinical trials. So I think, yes, we're, we're on the cusp. I think we've created the infrastructure. I think we've got the, the word out there. Um, it, is there more to do? Absolutely. But am I encouraged? Yeah, absolutely. I think we, we really have accomplished quite a bit. And as Terry so eloquently stated, we have a fantastic team um, that's worked together. So Terry, I'll, I'll give you last word. Just, just second everything that's said, and it's only through partnership with patients and advocates and um, participation that we can learn um, about these diseases and improve care. And I think by reaching out and educating and empowering and um, partnering with patients is how we're going to make a difference. So thanks, David, for participating today. It was great. Yep. Thank you, David. So um, thank, thank you, Dr. Armstrong. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. Thank you to the NCI's Moonshot program and to all the participants here today. Um, you heard it from Dr. Gilbert, we're on the cusp. Let's keep going together. Thank you so much. And again, I would like to also echo my thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ans, for an excellent moderation. That's a, one of the most robust Q&A sessions we've had uh, in this series. And thank you again, Drs. Gilbert and Armstrong. And just wanna remind everyone that our next uh, seminar is May 26th. And you see it up there, uh, Advancing Patient Engagement and implementation, implementation Science to Improve Cancer Care. Well, uh, Dr. Zlau Men and Dr. Wittekang Malone. So thank you again. That was, that was great. Really appreciate it. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute, Cancer.gov, 1-800-4-CANCER.